Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Welcome to worship here at St. John's. We're here to be where the Lord has promised to be, where two or three are gathered. That is here and now. <coughs> it's wise to come before the Lord honestly with a confession of our failure to be God's people. So I invite you to rise and offer that confession as you found it, find it in your bullet. We gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us take a little time to confess before God and one another our sin and our failure to be God's people. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for the peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. <coughs> Lord, have mercy for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. 
with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God of creation, eternal majesty, you preside over land and sea, sunshine and storm. By your strength, pilot us. By your power, preserve us. By your wisdom, instruct us. And by your hand, protect us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The first lesson for today comes from the 38th chapter of Job. This comes toward the end of Job, and it's God's response to Job's constant haranguing God about his misfortune. The Lord, jo the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no further, and here, you shall, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. <clears throat> Let them 
exalt you in the assembly of the people. In the council of the elders, let them sing hallelujah. You stilled the storm and silenced the waves of the sea. second reading is from 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. <coughs> but as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We were treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown, and yet are well known, as dying, and see, we are alive, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affect affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. <clears throat> Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we call? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. Glory, Glory to, to you, O Lord. When evening had come, Jesus said to the disciples, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. And I believe there's a children's sermon today. No? no? no. That's unfortunate. I was hoping to see Priscilla today. Okay. The stilling of the storm. I'll tell you what. Let me take this off. The stilling of the storm. Um, I think the only way you can really get into this lesson is you have to think like someone from ancient times. You have, to, you have to have a sense of how creation worked in those days. So you gotta understand, they did not have um, the Weather Channel. They, they didn't. They did not have instruments to measure weather or the ability to see a storm going across the nation or anything like that. 
They just experienced whatever was out there. And the common view at that time, oh, there were some strange people, but the common view, the people who were writing scripture, of course, they viewed the earth as a flat expanse on which sea was on all sides and rain came from the sky, water came from the sky because there was water up there, but the doors opened to let it in. And if you dug down in the earth far enough, you got water. So that means everything was surrounded by water, which was dangerous, you know. And this is how it worked, and things just happened. So you got to understand, from their point of view, writing this scripture or looking at their world, they saw what was going on with this a great mystery, as something that couldn't really be explained. It was the work of God, an act of God, we still use that term. It was seen as something only God does. It involved God's desire or intent. So a storm blowing up meant punishment, something wrong. God was angry. And similarly, when you had fair weather and everything was beautiful, it meant that things were right, there was peace. And that was that story in Noah about the rainbow in the sky, signaling that God was at peace with everything. This is how people viewed the world. They, didn't, they wouldn't have questioned that. That was how it was. But you and I know differently, I hope, don't you? I'm going to come down a little closer. You and I, I think, I hope, know a little differently. I mean, pull out your uh, elementary school science. You, we know that hurricanes, tornadoes, storms don't happen um, just because God got angry. We understand that there are low pressure systems caused by the rotation of the earth and the movement of um, various uh, atmospheric conditions. We understand that things happen. We've gotten so good at it, we can track it from space. We can anticipate a hurricane or tornadoes even before they happen. We know that these things are not um, because God hates us. When bad things happen, we know, don't we, that it isn't because God's punishing us. Don't we? I hope so. Now, there's a little caveat I have to make because some bad things happen in weather that we do cause. <clears throat> And I'm thinking of the Dust Bowl in the 30s, 20s and 30s, when bad agricultural practices and misunderstanding of how things worked in the earth caused a horrible calamity. Similarly, we know that when we have good weather, we've got high pressure. We know that, you know, the warmth that comes from the south, thank God, it doesn't happen because we've been particularly good. We know that, don't we? All right, I'm just checking. It doesn't happen because we are particularly good. Although sometimes we do note that we do things right with the planet and we get the benefit of understanding what's going on and doing things correctly. So the bad things that happen aren't because we're particularly bad and the good things that happen aren't because we're particularly good. We understand why they happen how the world works. Something that back then when these stories were written, they had no clue about whatsoever. Yes, it's true that sometimes we feel like when a bad thing happens, we caused it. But we know better, don't we? Don't we? I mean, we joke a lot about the golf gods, for example, taking over when our shot goes awry. But we know we're joking. We know we're joking. I hope so. So, if you're going to read this gospel about Jesus stilling the storm, I think you have to read it with ancient eyes. It's a mystery. We don't know what's going on. If there's a storm, it must be because God has some retribution for us. And if it's fair weather, it must be because God has found something good in what we've done. So. We have to read it with that sense. So when you read that the, the writers are saying Jesus stilled the storm, they're telling you, my God, 
He's like God. He is God. The lesson ends with that comment. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Must be God involved. And therefore, if we're with Jesus, do we fear any more anything happening in the world, weather-wise? We are all very quiet today. If Jesus stills the storm, and the storms are caused by God, and Jesus is God, and we're with Jesus, I mean like he's in the boat with us, do we have anything to fear ever from storms? No. No. That's how you should read this. Oh my God, he's God. If we're with this guy, you don't need to fear anything. That's how you should read that. We know better, don't we? I mean, with 21st century eyes, we know that natural disasters happen. They happen. And sometimes people do die because they're terrible. And it's the working of the planet that we live in. Don't we know this? I hope so. God has given us a lot of knowledge about how this, th this planet works and the way its systems work. Um, we know these things are not just because God hates us, but they happen, and bad things happen, and people do die. And now we're a little different than those ancient people back then, because we can say in the midst of a storm, we know that this was a low-pressure system coming over, such and such and such, but my friend, my neighbor, passed away within the tornado. Where was Jesus? If Jesus is the one who's going to still the storm, where was he this time? And people do ask that when they're involved in a disaster. You know that. If Jesus stilled that storm, why not this one? See, I think that's something that the ancients wouldn't have thought of. If we're with Jesus, the storm is going to get stilled. Hmm. And therefore, if it didn't get stilled, must be something wrong with you, because you weren't with Jesus. <clears throat> Are you still with me? Because a lot of people still think that way. I don't. I know that things happen. People do die. I know this. I know that in a disaster, it isn't because God hated us or we did something terribly wrong. I know this. This is God-given knowledge. God wants us to know this. God expects us to know this. God wants us to know how the planet works. At least I think so. And that changes the way we look at this. You know, Jesus is not like some magic talisman who's going to take away all the danger around us. We know that things work certain ways. So I'm going to give you the line, I think, from Spider-Man with great knowledge comes great responsibility. If you know how things work and you do stupid things, whose fault is that? God's? We know better than this. Jesus is not, and belief in Jesus is not some magic amulet that will protect us from everything. In fact, we understand differently that God has given us the ability to understand things and therefore God has given us the responsibility of taking actions when we need to to protect ourselves and deal with God's creation the way God has ta taught us how to deal with it. Fair enough? And if you don't believe that, there are lots of, there are legions of answers or examples of this. For example, if you're building your house in a floodplain, you should know better. Now, I recognize that some people don't have an, uh, the ability to choose, but my point is, you know this, right? It's not a good idea if you can avoid it. Similarly, 
If you're living in a tornado area, maybe you should make plans to put in one of those shelters. By the way, I was reading about this recently. There's a, a way of putting in a, like a concrete shelter in any home that protects you from a tornado. It would be a good idea to do that if you're living in a tornado area. Make sense? Lots of, le there are legions of answers about why we take the climate and the uh, natural world differently than people reading this. And if you're going to go out skiing and you want to go into the back country, you know that it would be a bad idea to do it when there's an avalanche danger. And on and on and on. There's all these examples of how God has given us knowledge and then the responsibility to use that knowledge well. This is how things work. And I'll just as one last example to try and keep you awake. You remember the old joke about the old couple who believed desperately that Jesus would protect them from any danger, but they were caught in a flood. And as the waters rose to the first floor, they went to the second, and they said, Lord, we, know, we trust that you will protect us. And a boat came up. And the guy said, jump in, we'll get you out of here. And the, women, the couple said, no, we trust that Jesus will protect us. The waters kept rising, and they went to the roof. And a helicopter came over, and it said, Grab on to the line. We'll get you out of here. But they said, no, we trust in Jesus. It will be all right. You know this joke, right? And the water came up to the roof and drowned them. And they got to heaven. And they said to St. Peter, where were you? We trusted in that Jesus would save us from the flood. And Peter's response was, well, I sent you a boat and a helicopter. Why didn't you use them? With great knowledge comes responsibility. To use that knowledge well and understand that the Lord is not trusting Jesus to get us out of a situation, but trusting us to use our good sense, if we can, to get out of the situation. All right, I'm almost done. Does this mean there's no comfort in Jesus like those ancients took comfort who is this that stills the wind and the wave? When we're with Jesus, we have nothing to fear. Is there no comfort for us who have this knowledge about the way things work? You know, this is what's interesting about faith. I think Paul said it better than this story of the stilling of the storm. I think Paul understood this more and to a different level than than this simple, Jesus will get you out of danger. Can I read you Romans 8? This is one of my favorite passages, but it says something that I think is important when you consider the stilling of the storm. Paul wrote, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution, famine, peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are out of the sheep and slaughter. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. I will add storms, tornadoes, you name it. Will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our faith is not based in that God will protect us from every danger we get into. Our faith is based in a great, great love that goes beyond all of this, even death itself. That's our comfort. That's the thing that God calls us to trust in. That's why Jesus' comment to the disciples in the boat still sits, only a different kind of faith. He says, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Well, that's not going to protect you from dying. 
but it's going to protect you from living like you're dying. It's going to protect you from understanding that your life is held dear or protect you from not understanding that your life is held dear. It's going to protect you to see that your life is dear, is held dear, is important and valuable and worth living and is freed from its past. You are forgiven and prepared for its future. You are promised a life that's different but eternal. That's what we trust in. God calls us to trust in that. Not to use our faith as some magic amulet that will protect us from danger. But to trust in the love of God that goes beyond all things. And to be wise about the world with the knowledge God's given us. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? God, give us that faith. to rise and offer a confession of our faith in the Lord using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in our prayer. Holy God, you gather your people from east and west, north and south. We pray for the mission of the church throughout the world, that your steadfast love may be made known to all peoples. Lord, in your mercy. You laid the foundations of the earth, and the waters are the womb of creation. The morning stars sing your name, and all creation shouts for joy. 
we pray for your blessed creation, that we may cherish and tend it, that it magnify your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you keep watch over all nations. We pray for countries experiencing violence, hunger, unrest. Guide worldwide and local community organizations in their efforts to establish safety and justice. Lord, in your mercy. You are close to the brokenhearted, near to those in distress. We pray for those who experience oppression. Liberate us from the systems and chains that bind us and bind all people. Remove the barriers that separate us from one another. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you dwell with us in this faith community. We pray for leaders and elders here at St. John's. Grant them knowledge, patience, and kindness that through their leadership you may be exalted in this assembly. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your love endures in all situations. On this Father's Day, we pray for those who are fathers or wish to be fathers, for those with broken or strained relationships, for those who miss their fathers, for fathers who have lost children. Bless and strengthen all of these, your people. Lord, in your mercy, we lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take a moment to share that peace in some responsible way. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.
clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your free spirit. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated, and there may be some announcements for today. We do. We have a few. Uh, first of all, if you have any announcements to share, please make sure you email them to announcements at stjohnsmartinsburg.org or call the church office. We understand that life happens, but please do your best to get them in by Thursday. Altar flowers today are in loving memory of Mr. and Mrs. Henry S. R. Wilson by their daughters Anne Niven or Naveen and Mary Ellen Daly. Flowers are needed starting uh, August 1st. Please sign up in the Narthex or call the office. Today at 1230 is the last Sunday school for Zoom Sunday School. Please look for other emails about summer activity bags, look, and we are looking forward to seeing you on Zoom today. There will be a congregational meeting on July the 11th after worship. During this meeting, we will be making critical decisions about repairs needed to our building and about the Elaine Bennett property disposition. Please make every effort to attend this meeting as we cannot make any decisions without a proper quorum. We have a fast approaching deadline with the city of Martinsburg to complete these repairs. If a quorum is not achieved, we will try again on July the 18th, but please do everything you can in your power to be here on that day. The Bloodmobile will be in Luther Hall on June 23rd. That's this coming Wednesday. Please register ahead to donate much needed blood. Go to the Red Cross, the Red Cross uh, blood.org give um, website, type in the 25401 zip code and choose St. John's to register. Friends from Feeding Friends will be serving on June 26th. Please see Candy or Jerry if you would like to help in any way. And I know all help will be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Have an amazing day. Thank you, Drew. I invite you to rise if, you, if you're able and receive a blessing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Bless you now and forever. Amen.
to God. 